Thank you for letting us sing all three of those verses. Absolutely. You weren't here and we just made a decision. <laughs> well, I've always been taught when, when I need something, if I'm preaching, I need to shout it out. Oh, yeah. But my whole sermon's based on that song. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Glad to do it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> It's a joy, a real joy to be back with you this morning. I've looked forward uh, to coming and sharing God's word with you for the last uh, five or six, seven weeks. Whenever Eddie called to invite me to come, said he'd be out for a few days, would I come and fill in for him? And I said, absolutely. And I've been looking forward to this. Where is Debbie? Debbie. Uh, I did, uh, I helped uh, with five church camps years ago. And on Thursday afternoon, do y'all still do the shaving cream wars? This year we used to do. Oh, I tell you, that is a wonderful climax <laughs> to church camp. I remember going into uh, Walmart uh, one morning and uh, going to look for shaving cream, and uh, what I needed was 600 cans of shaving cream. <laughs> and of course, they don't have that many on the shelf. And so I, I found uh, an employee, and I said, uh, do y'all sell shaving cream by the case? And you're talking about a funny look. <laughs> and uh, she said, yes, we do. I guess we do. And I said, how many uh, cans of shaving cream are in a case? And she said, well, that depends on what kind of case you want. And I said, well, I need 600 cans of shaving cream. And she just shook her head and she said, I'm not even going to ask why. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I'm telling you, to see 120, 125 kids running around, with counselors uh, uh, on that, what I call the soccer field or the football field as you go in to Camp Wesley Pine uh, about an hour before we go eat and uh, we have uh, water hoses on all four ends of that field and my goodness, the joy of a shaving cream battle. I want to share with you this morning um, uh, from Romans chapter 8. And uh, are, are you going to put the, have you got the message? I tell you what, just leave yours off if you will, okay? I'm going to read from the message this morning. Uh, I've grown in love with this version of the Bible. Uh, because it, it, it uh, speaks to my heart. Uh, it uh, shares uh, God's word in a way that just makes it real easy for me to connect. I don't use it all the time. But this morning, uh, that's what I'm sharing from. This is God's word for us this morning. May we hear and be receptive of his word to us. Paul has been talking about the battle of sin and the difference between living a sin-filled life and living a forgiven, grace-filled life and how we as human beings struggle to make choices within that. And in verse 8, in chapter 8, he begins by telling us the solution to this dilemma is Jesus Christ. Hear God's word for us this morning. Now, with the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, that faithful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous, low-lying black cloud. A new 
power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you and me from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. God went for the juggler when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote and unimportant. In his son Jesus, he personally took on the human condition, entered the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. The law code, weakened as it always was by fractured human nature, could have never done that. The law always ended up being used as a band-aid on sin instead of a deep healing of it. And now what the law code asked for, but we couldn't deliver, is accomplished as we, instead of redoubling our own efforts, simply embrace what the Holy Spirit is doing in us. And those who think that they can do it on their own end up obsessed and measuring their own moral muscle, but never get around to exercising it in real life. You see, for those who trust God's action in them and find that God's spirit is in them, living and breathing God is a normal thing. Obsession with self in those matters is a dead end, but attention to God leads us out into the open, into a spacious and free life. Focusing on self is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God, ends up thinking more about self than God, and that person ignores who God is and what God is doing, and God isn't pleased when that happens. But if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. But for you who welcome him, in whom he dwells, even though you are still experiencing all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. It stands to reason, doesn't it? that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, and he does, as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life With his spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ. So don't you see that we don't owe this old do-it-yourself life one red cent? There's nothing in it for us, nothing at all. The best thing to do is to give it a decent burial and get on with your new life. God's spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? God's spirit touches our spirit and confirms who we are. We know who he is, and we know who we are, father and children. And we know if we're going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance, we go through exactly what Christ goes through 
and if we go through the hard times with him, then we will certainly be going into the good times with him as well. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for the people of God. Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would bless the hearing and the reading of your word. That your words and the words that you would speak through may might touch all of our hearts this morning. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I want to talk about the doctrine of assurance. Over the last two years, as part of the cabinet and as part of the district leadership team, I've been reading a tremendous amount about discipleship. And so many leaders in all the mainline and evangelical churches today are saying the same thing, that the reason that the church is going down is because we've done such a wonderful job receiving members in the church, but we've not done nearly as good a job as making disciples of those members. Jesus never asked us to make members. He asked us to make disciples and to be able to love him with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and our neighbor as ourself. You see, I believe that discipleship is a contact sport. It's a sport that we connect with the Holy Spirit, that we connect with one another, and we connect with the world as well. I want to share a story about the founder of the Methodist movement, John Wesley. Wesley was born in the early 1700s. His father was an Anglican priest, and John followed into the uh, same as his dad and became a, a priest in the Church of England. And he understood his calling was to promote scriptural holiness within the church calling people to repent of their sins and live a godly life so that they might have assurance of their salvation. And I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, that message didn't go over well in England during that time. In fact, Wesley was not given a church to preach. So Wesley went out into the streets out into the countryside, wherever he could preach. And he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. A gospel that calls for repentance of sin and to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior and to be assured that we belong to him, that we've been forgiven of our sins. In 1736, John and Charles decided to travel to America, to Savannah, Georgia. It was Wesley's hope to be able to the preach to the people of Savannah and also to the Indians in the community, surrounding community, to share God's message of love and salvation in Jesus. He was there for almost two years. And when he left, he, he felt like he was a failure because things didn't particularly happen the way he thought they should happen. But George Whitfield, a very close friend of Wesley, who was there in Savannah at that time, said, oh, what a blessing God shared with the people of Savannah with John Wesley. Wesley left depressed, thinking himself a failure, and when he traveled back to England one night while they were traveling, a, a violent storm arose and he along with a, a group of German Moravians were down in the bottom of the ship and the ship was being tossed to and fro and Wesley believed that he was going to die. And he heard singing coming from another part of the bottom of the ship and so he came out of his 
place, and lo and behold, these Moravians had gathered there, singing and praising God. Wesley didn't understand that. He, he didn't understand why anybody would be singing and praising God when they were about to perish. And so he asked one of the Moravians, aren't you afraid that you're going to die? And he told Wesley, absolutely not. Because I belong to God, and I know God is with me, and God has his hand underneath me. Wesley did not have that assurance. You see, for John Wesley, Wesley had Jesus here, but he didn't have him here. And a few months after returning to England in May of 1738, John Wesley went to what I would call a, a Bible study, maybe a small group. And this is what he wrote in his journal that night. In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society at Aldersgate Street where one was reading from the preface of Romans. You understand what the preface of Romans and about a quarter to nine, while the leader was speaking about the change which God works in the heart of people through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. And I felt I did trust in Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Brothers and sisters, that's just what Paul was writing about. That night, if Wesley could have heard that song that Fanny Crosby wrote 150 years later about blessed assurance, when he was coming home, he would have sung, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine heir of salvation and purchased of God, born of his spirit and washed in his blood. This is my story. Is it your story? So my question this morning, those of you who have heard me preach before, you know I like to ask questions. How well is it with your soul? Now, I know how you're going to answer. Everything's fine. Glad you asked. But I know when you step back and you think about that question and you humbly bow before the Christ who died on the cross for us and was resurrected so we might have new life, I know because you're a human being just like me, it's not always well with your soul. But I know that's what God wants it to be. Do you have the blessed assurance that Fanny Crosby wrote about and we just sang? And I know that's a very strong question from a visiting district superintendent. But I think it's a very spirit-filled question as well. So I want to begin by using the 15th and 16th verses of Romans 8 for us to begin to think about this question. Paul writes, and by him, that is Jesus, we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Any children of God here this morning? This assurance of salvation is much more than a warm, fuzzy feeling. Its authenticity is not measured just by one's emotion. It remains even when feelings are low and troubles are thick as mosquitoes that we've been dealing with over these last rainy, hot summer days. Paul taught us that there are two witnesses involved when we think about our salvation and our assurance of that. The Spirit of the Holy, the Holy Spirit 
and our spirit. And when these two spirits agree, our soul experiences a great sense of freedom and joy. It's like when two people fall in love and the man holds his breath as he holds his beloved sweetheart and he tells her with all of his heart, I love you, baby. And she looks back into his eyes and she says, I love you too. Wow, it doesn't get any better than that, does it? <laughs> Earl, can you remember that? Huh? I know Margie can. Part of God's family, brothers and sisters, it just doesn't ever get any better than that. Wesley offered these words, that this assurance that we've been talking about is an inward impression on the soul, whereby the Spirit of God tells me that I'm a child of God and that Jesus loves me, gave his life for me, blotted out all of my sins, and now I am fully reconciled to God. Are you, my brothers and sisters, are you assured of your salvation this morning? Wesley believed that God's Spirit gives this salvation so that you and I will never have to doubt. In 1 John 5, verse 13, we read, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know. I'm so glad that he's... John didn't say that you might have the hope of knowing. He said that you might know that you have eternal life. God's word assures it, and the Holy Spirit confirms it. So church, the witness of the Holy Spirit seeks to accomplish several things in our life. This morning I'm going to talk about a few that deal with our assurance of salvation. First, the witness of the Holy Spirit brings us closer to God into an intimacy relationship with God. And I chose the message this morning because where it, the other translation says that Jesus said you, you and I can call God Abba, Father. I want to tell you that created a huge disturbance when Jesus said that with the Jews. Because they wouldn't even call God God. God was held out. They didn't want to get too close to God. They thought if they just kept the law, they'd be fine with God. But they couldn't keep the law. And God knew that. And that's why he sent Jesus. And when Jesus says that we can call God Abba, he's talking about God is calling us to Come close to him and to embrace the fullness of his love. You young people, please hear that. God is calling you to come close to him. Don't worry about what everybody else might think. Come close and embrace God's love for you. The message says that we can call God Papa. I want to tell you, I just love that. That's how my grandchildren address me. And I want them to know how much I love them. I want them to know that there is nothing in the world that they can do to ever stop me from loving them. Papa. Papa. I like the story about two first grade boys. On the first day of school, the teacher had asked the students to kind of introduce themselves so they would begin to know something about their classmates. And one of the boys says, me and Jack are brothers. One of us is adopted and the other ain't. <laughs> but I can't remember which is which. All who believe in Christ, Paul says, are adopted. God came after us because of his love for us. 
You see, what God desires from us is an intimate, personal relationship. One that is growing each and every day. And brothers and sisters, I don't say this in judgment. This is just where I am right now in my own life. We have people in the church, every denomination in this country, that are not embracing God's love. They're not interested in doing that because they're so full of themselves. It's all about me and what I'm doing. And besides, if I come close to God, God may ask something of me like he asked of Jim Fisher. But don't be afraid. Come close. Papa is there waiting. The reason God wants us to have this intimate, personal relationship is that we might understand and comprehend for ourselves all the promises that are in the Bible for us. And not only the promises, but to understand the fullness of God's love. So once again, do you have the assurance this morning of your salvation? God is asking. The Holy Spirit is knocking. Because he loves us. Secondly, the witness of the Spirit seeks to give us courage and confidence in our day-to-day living. In the scripture that I just read from Romans 8, Paul states that you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. I can't tell you How many times God was inviting me to do something and I did not do it because I was afraid I would fail. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing on God's green earth that's wrong with failing. God just wants us to try it and to see what he can do with us. I wear a lapel pin on my jacket. It reads, it reads, living out the power of we. And that we means you and me working with the Holy Spirit to do what God's called us all to do, to be disciples of Jesus Christ. And to tell the story Because you have a story and I have a story. And people need to hear our stories of what God has done in our lives. And we do it best by doing it together with the Holy Spirit. And finally, the witness of the Spirit gives us a sure hope for the future. 17th verse of the 8th chapter of Romans speaks about This assurance that God wants to give us will give us, help us to understand that we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Do you know what that means? I I know some of you have heard me say this. That means that heaven belongs to you and me. Heaven belongs to us. Jesus told his disciples on the eve of his arrest, that he was going to prepare a place for them. And if he went to prepare a place for them, he would come back to get us so that we could be with him. Heaven belongs to us. And Paul has the audacity to say that we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. And not only about heaven, it's about everything that Christ had himself. Way back during the Depression years, for you young people, that was back in the late 20s and early 30s. That was a long time before I was born. But this distraught woman walked into an insurance office. 
She told the reception that since her husband died that she could no longer pay the premiums for her life insurance. The reception asked her to be seated and she went back to the agent's office and he came out with a file. And he sat down and he talked to the lady and he told the lady, did you not know that your husband had an insurance policy? She said, no, he never told me. And he said, at, at his death, you should have received from the insurance company a check of $200,000. You see, this woman thought she was poor when in actuality she was rich. Now let me uh, see if I can apply this story in a spiritual way to us this morning. All the spiritual riches that belong to Jesus, his gift of salvation, his power, his joy, his love, his peace, those things that Randy spoke about in his prayer this morning belong to you and me. You see, Jesus has already paid the premium on Calvary. All the benefits of that policy belong to us if we're willing to endorse it by faith. You might say, well, I'm not sure that I have the assurance, Brother Jim, that you're talking about, so how can I get it? You wouldn't be alone. One recent survey that I read about showed that between 70 and 80% of all Americans, Christians and non-Christians, are living defeated lives. And I'm convinced that the witness of the Holy Spirit can transform that attitude of defeat into victory. Didn't we open up this service by singing victory in Jesus? Assurance comes to us as the Holy Spirit seeks to live within us. Years ago, when I was serving one of my first churches, I had finished my sermon and had given an invitation. And I gave an invitation oftentimes and invited anyone that the Spirit was leading to come down. And this person came down. It was a woman. And she prayed until after we had finished the closing hymn. So we just didn't finish it. We kept singing it. And every Sunday at the invitation, the same woman would come down. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Month after month. And I finally told her one Sunday after church was over, I would love for you to come and talk with me. I want to know why you keep coming to the prayer rail. And she said, oh, Brother Jim, I'd love to do that. So we set up a time and she came. And I asked her, I said, tell me, if you don't mind me being so personal, tell me what you're continuing to pray for. And she said, I'm praying for my salvation. And I said, have you ever invited Christ into your life? And she said, oh, many years ago. But she said, you don't know my background. And I smiled and I said, and you don't know my background. But I said, God doesn't want you to continue to pray for something that is already yours. And she said, well, Jim, how can I, how can I be so assured? And so I opened up my Bible to Romans 10, 9 and 10. Brothers and sisters, this is one of the most important scriptures in all the Bible. Paul is writing about this assurance of salvation. He says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and that you're saved. I know, as sure as I'm standing here, that John Wesley kept coming back to that study on Romans. 
And I know that he knew it, it was there, but sometimes we read something and it doesn't mean anything, but when he read that passage, it just, that blessed assurance just jumped all over him again. Brothers and sisters, God longs for us to be saved. And he longs for us to know that we're saved. That's one of the reasons why God sent his Holy Spirit to us. To give us that blessed assurance. And if you don't have it, keep doing what John Wesley did. Keep praying for it. Keep praying for it. Keep praying for it. And God will give it to you. Let's pray. Papa, thank you so much for the gift of Jesus. In his willingness to leave heaven and come down to us. To be born as a human and to understand all the things that we deal with. All the temptations to turn away from you. All the temptations to hurt one another. All the temptations to do everything that you seek for us not to do. Thank you, Lord, that he paid the price for our sins. And thank you for his resurrection, which seeks to bring new life to us. And thank you, Papa, for the gift of your Holy Spirit. And seeks to live in us and walk with us and talk with us and tell us that we belong to you. That we're your children. That we're a part of your family, and you have called us to tend to the family business, to be disciples of Jesus, to tell our stories, and to tell everyone that we might see that you put in front of us about your love, about the salvation that can be ours through your son Jesus. And how we might have the blessed assurance of that reality. Thank you, Papa, for First United Methodist Church. For her long, rich history of making a difference in this community. For the pastors who have served so faithfully and the one who is serving faithfully right now. For the, lay, for the faithful lay laity of this church who have given and sacrificed and committed and yet Lord I pray that all of that will continue that first Methodist Pascagoula will be more in the coming days and weeks and months and years than it has been in the past and that all of us will look to you for the things that we need most of all your love and your grace. So Lord, continue to pour out your blessings on these that are here and on this church and on the leadership of this church and on the families, the children and the youth and every adult. Lord, what a pleasure it's been to share your word. And we give you thanks and honor and praise for who you are and what you're doing in our lives today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.